Welcome to our Prophecy Seminar. We want to welcome all of our returning guests, and we also want to welcome those who are here for the first night. If this is your first night, we want to remind you or to inform you that you're able to go back and look at the previous um, YouTube videos on the messages that Pastor Jules has been presenting each and every night. May God bless you as we continue to study uh, God's Word, and I pray that you will truly be blessed. This is the sixth night of our Prophecy Seminar. The last five messages have been truly a blessing, and I pray that you will continue to tune in each and every night. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, though. If you could please invite your friends, families, neighbors, co-workers, because they too may, be having, may have questions on what is God's plan for the future? What is God's plan for you and I for the future? And we want those questions answered. And each night as you listen in, you will hear God's plan. Now continue to watch as we listen to the Word of God given to us by Dr. Jules. Thank you. We begin the second week this Sunday evening for our uh, seminar on Bible prophecy. I am again delighted to thank my beloved friend and your pastor, Pastor Lisa Smith, for the invitation to join you at the First Church in Washington, D.C. for these two weeks of intense study in the Word of God. Tonight, we bring to you a message on, Is America Mentioned in Bible Prophecy? I know that you'll be blessed. I know that God has a word for you. And I'm certain that as we study, our hearts will be stirred, our minds enlightened, and our souls lifted heavenward. I pray for you that you will be faithful to our Lord till he comes. So let's get right into the word of God tonight as we study. Also, Today, my brothers and sisters, it gives me great joy and pleasure to stand before you because... I am just amazed at God's amazing grace. I am only here by the grace of God. And so today for this service, I want to bring to you a subject on this day on Is America Recorded in Bible Prophecy? Does the Bible have anything to say about the United States of America. Truth of the matter is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, the Bible could not record every nation, Brazil and Jamaica, but the Bible has something to say about the United States of America. And it's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. And I would not preach it unless it's in the Word of God. And I want you to know today that this message is not only informative, but it's scary. It's scary at best. If you would listen to me, and if you would follow me today, you would know that God is speaking directly to us in these times, in these difficult times of COVID-19, and when the world is panicking. God wants us to know that there is a word for us. It's a prophetic word. It's God's word. Would you bow your heads with me? We'll pray and ask for God's illumination, and then we'll get started. Loving Father, we pray for your spirit to speak to our hearts and to teach us this day. Make plain and simple to your children this prophetic word. As we hear, help us to so align our lives with your divine will that we'll be able to stand what's coming upon this world. And be ultimately saved in your eternal kingdom. Make us to be an obedient people. And may your Holy Spirit fill us up this day. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. My friends, the United States of America, as it stands today, and the Constitution of the United States, guarantees liberty and freedom for all. I want to ask you a question Will these historic freedoms ever be challenged? Does the Bible mention the United States in prophecy? Well, I believe it does. 
Whenever I return from traveling to other countries and I come back home to the United States of America, I recognize that there is a wonderful freedom we have here. For all the problems and difficulties and craziness coming out of the White House, this is still a country where we can worship God in harmony and according to the dictates of our conscience. Just yesterday, the President of the United States uh, reminded us that he's going to open up all of the churches for a man who is Now this country, this country has been miraculously raised up by God and blessed with fields of waving grain, teeming city streets, green forests and babbling brooks, and liberty and justice for all. What does the Bible say about the future of this country? Will this religious liberty that the United States has championed through the centuries continue? Whenever you come into New York Harbor, you see the Statue of Liberty and recall those famous words, give me your tide, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. You see the lovely lady lifting her torch of freedom above the New York Harbor where thousands of refugees have arrived. Now, those early framers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were guided not by their own thoughts, but were providentially guided by God. When the pilgrims courageously left Europe on the little Mayflower and crossed the Atlantic to the unknown wilderness of the United States, they came to escape the totalitarian religious oppression of the past. They wanted to found a country that had a state without a king and a church without a pope. They founded a country that had both civil and religious liberty. Their hearts yearned for a republican democratic form of government. A nation without a state church. For they knew all too well the abuses of the union of church and state in Europe. Those early Americans made clear statements about the separation of church and state. Does the Bible predict that one day our freedoms will be eroded? Does the Bible teach that one day, even in the United States, church and state will unite under the beast power? Does the Bible teach that one day the constitutional amendments that guarantee religious freedom will be repudiated? Notice the early framers of the Constitution wrote those religious guarantees into the Bill of Rights in these words. Congress shall make no laws respecting the establishment of religion, of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Revelation 13, 1 to 10 examined the identifying marks of the beast power, verses 1 to 10. There are two beast powers. There are two beasts in Revelation 13. The first beast is a composite, part lion, part bear, part leopard, part dragon. In another study, I have shown or will show you that the lion represented Babylon in Bible prophecy, the bear represented Medo-Persia, the leopard represented Greece, and the dragon represented pagan Rome. But God helps us in the first part. What I'm focusing today on is verses 11 and onward, the second beast of Revelation 13. But allow me to set it up by referencing the first beast. Notice that the beast of Revelation 13, the first beast, gets his power, his seat, and great authority from the dragon. We know from history that pagan Rome gave the seat of its government to papal Rome, the Rome of the popes. There are seven identifying marks that the beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10 
it gives us those seven identifying marks, reminds us that it is the papal power. It got its seat of government from pagan Rome. That's number one. It would be a worldwide system of worship exactly as the papacy is a universal religious power today. Third identifying mark of the first beast, it would speak blasphemy, presuming the prerogatives of God, the power to forgive sins, for example. Only God can forgive sins, but the first beast says the church, the Roman church, has the power to forgive sins. Number four, it would be a persecuting power, and through the Middle Ages, the papal power persecuted the people of God. Through the Dark Ages, over 50 million Christians were killed by the Roman church. Number five, the power would reign for 1,260 years and then go into captivity. The papacy reigns supreme from 8538 to 1798, exactly as the Bible said, 1,260 years. Number six, the beast, his deadly wound would be healed after 1798. And we have seen a resurgence of the power and influence of the papacy. Everywhere the Pope goes, there are millions, hundreds of thousands of people who flock with rosaries in their hands, clutching their rosaries, hoping to catch a glimpse of the Pope. Revelation 13, 17 and 18 says, the number of the beast's name is 666. The Pope's most exalted title, Vicar of the Son of God, Vicarious Philly Day, totals 666. No more, no less. Now these seven points of prophecy, all of which have been remarkably fulfilled in the history of the Roman papacy, point a damning finger at the papal power. But Revelation 13 talks about the second beast. And I will show you, I will show you that the United States and the United States alone fits every detail of the prophecy. I'm going to give you five clues. The nation, this nation, represents in biblical prophecy the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Here it is, Revelation 13 and verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. <laughs> you got to understand this today, my brothers and sisters. Revelation 13, 11. It reminds us about the second beast and the Bible gives us some clues that will help us to understand who this beast is and no other nation on the face of the earth can match these clues. Revelation 13.10 positions us precisely in the stream of time for it says the nation arose at the right time. It says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Which history tells us happened in 1798. The right time. Now at the same time, the Bible describes the papal power. The first beast of Revelation 13 going into captivity. The Bible then says in the next verse, Revelation 13, 11, And I beheld another beast coming up. That's the text. And because it's called another beast, it comes up at the time when the papacy goes into captivity. So this second power comes up around the year 1798 when the first beast is going into captivity. The United States of America arose at the right time to meet this biblical prophetic specification. In 1776, the founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence, breaking all ties with England. Then it fought the Revolutionary War, which ended a peace treaty in 1783. Then in 1787, the Constitution was framed, 
And in March of 1789, it went into effect. George Washington served as the first president until 1797. Thus we come to the year 1798 when the nation is introduced in prophecy. And as we look at history, it confirms that not only one world power came about, it confirms that only one world power came about in 1798, and that's the United States of America. Revelation 13, 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Second clue, it arose in the right place. Hmm. This is symbolic language. Absence of water denotes scarcity of people. Revelation tells us that in prophecy, when you see the word water, it represents peoples. So this nation could not arise among the crowded nationalities of the old world. The United States did arise out of new, previously unoccupied territory. The wilderness of this vast American continent, unpopulated but for a few scattered Indian tribes, marvelously fits this prophecy. This great continent, kept hidden by God in a small world, became the cradle for the newborn nation. Revelation 12, 6 says, The earth helped the woman. Who is the woman? The church. And the flood of pilgrims who fled to the new world to escape the peril and persecution of papal-dominated Rome and Europe. Now this land of liberty became a haven of refuge, a sanctuary for saints oppressed for their faith. Hmm. History bears account of everything I just shared with you. But here's a third clue. It is depicted as a political power. The term beast in Revelation 13, 11 is the symbol, Bible symbol, of a kingdom or a nation. John said, this second beast, you see it in Revelation 13, 11, this new political power, he had two horns like a lamb. The government symbolized by this second beast is introduced in the early part of its career. That is, while still a youthful power. This beast is a young nation. Why didn't John simply say he had two horns? Why does he add like a lamb? Because it's a young nation. A lamb's horns are horns that have barely begun to grow. Here is a baby nation. A lamb is a new baby animal. So here is a baby nation that has lamb-like qualities of innocence starting around 1798 in a sparsely populated area of the earth, developing on a new continent. The United States of America fits this prophetic description to the max. Then I saw, Revelation 13, 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, sparsely populated area, and he had two horns, like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you before I say it. The day is coming when this lamb-like beast of Revelation 13 will one day speak like a dragon. It's a fourth clue. It's a democracy. The second beast which arises in unpopulated territory had two horns like a lamb. What's missing on his horns that the first beast had? The first beast in Revelation 13 had crowns on his horns. But this beast has none. The first beast, the, for this beast, the second beast, had no kingly power. Crowns represents kingly power. Since a crown is the fitting symbol of a monarchy, the notable absence of a crown in this case clearly indicates a democratic government Vesting its power in the hands of the people, not in any ruling king. Now, I know Trump would love to be a king. But it's not. This nation is a republic. Had the second beast been depicted in prophecy wearing a crown, I could not preach this sermon today. 
because it would not have represented the United States of America because the USA has never had a king. The early patriots claimed we have a state without a king and a church without a pope. That's what they ran from in Europe. Revelation 13, 14 may explain that this power says to the people that they should make an image to the beast. A dictator or powerful king can say, just do it. But look at what the text says. That they, the people, that represents a democracy. Let me give you the fifth clue to identify the United States and then we'll move on. Revelation 13, 12 says that this second lamb-like beast causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What the Bible is saying here, my brothers and sisters, that this beast that today affords religious liberty and civil liberty, that's what the two horns represent. That's on the second beast. Religious liberty or freedom to worship God or any God you feel you need to worship and worship him any way you choose to. Religious freedom and civil liberties. There are civil liberties in this country. Your property is protected by law. Your person is protected by law. You have the right to vote. You have the right to exist. You have the right to invest. You have the right to do as you please as long as you do not break the law and hurt anybody else. That's civil liberties. The two horns on this second beast represents religious liberty and civil liberty. And the Bible says that those two rights granted to every citizen will one day be taken away by this same beast power, the United States of America. And that lamb-like beast will start speaking like a dragon. <laughs> Listen to me, folks. This is not a popular message, but it's a biblical message. This, the United States will change its character from a lamb to a dragon. And those of us who live in this country sense that this country was raised up and designed by God. How ironic that this country that's been the world's foremost fortress of religious liberty becomes the devil's instrument to implement the mark of the beast. And listen to this. It says, and he, the United States, chapter 13 and verse 12, exerciseth all the power of the first beast, papal Rome, before him that causeth the earth of them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. <laughs> listen to me, folk. These are serious times. Daniel seven twenty eight. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. The waters which you saw, the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. These are the three things I just shared with you. Talking about that beast power. We need to have some answers. Where this beast power arises, it arises in a scarcely populated area on a new continent in the United States of America, on the North American continent. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. This new beast comes up out of the earth and unpopulated area. And when does this beast arise? We're reviewing it. He who leads them into captivity shall go into captivity. Hmm. The Pope was taken captive in 1798. The deadly beast, the first beast, received its deadly wound. But listen to me, folk. Because I'm standing here today and I'm preaching to you. Prophecy has come through. That deadly beast and wound has been healed. <laughs> and so the papacy ruled with supreme authority and power and persecuted Christians from 538 to 1798, 1260 years as the Bible predicted. And here it is, the third question, how this power arises. <laughs> Look at the text. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Two horns like a lamb. It's a young nation. The United States fits this to the max. Why? No crowns on the horns of the second beast. 
The first beast had crowns. Revelation 13, 1, And then I stood on the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. Kingly power. But the United States, we've got no king in our state and no pope in our church. Crowns indicate kingly power. I just wanted to review that for you. The lack of crowns indicates freedom, democracy. The government is created for the people and by the people. Laws of Congress are supposed to be created for the people and by the people, their representatives. Here's a nation that has espoused freedom. Freedom to worship in your church. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, Pastor Keith Morris, and he said something to me that stuck in my mind. He said, Jules, do you realize how easy it is for the state to just shut down every church? Every church has been shut down. He said, do you realize that when the prophecy comes to pass, it will happen just like this. One night we'll go to sleep and we are told you can't go back to your church. <laughs> Freedoms. Horns are symbols of power. They indicate that this second beast derives its power from political and religious freedom. That's where it gets its power. This nation became great. And America has done a lot of good around the world. It has introduced democracy. Fought for the rights of men and women who are persecuted around the world. It has stood up against totalitarian governments. America has done so much good in this world. Talking about freedom. Here is this lamb-like beast. Rising around 1798, arise in a relatively unpopulated area. The new world compared with the old, G. A. Towson, page 635 says, The mystery of her coming forth from vacancy, like a silent seed, we grew into an empire. Emerging amid the silence of the earth, adding daily to its power and strength. Rising around 1798, arise in a relatively unpopulated, it would be a young nation. Number four, it would have no crowned head, no kingly authority. Number five, it would rise to a position of worldwide power and influence. Everywhere you go in this world, the United States has influence. The United States has transported its culture, its music, its style. Anywhere you go in the world, you will see America imprinted on the world. I arrived in Johannesburg, South Africa some years ago to go preach at a university. And when I got there... First time in South Africa, in Johannesburg, my wife and I, we are driving down the highway, and I look across and I see Firestone. I see Sears and Roebuck. I see at American stores. I see McDonald's. I began feeling at home. America has transported its culture, its dress, its music, everywhere in this world. The power of the United States of America. Not the largest country in the world. Third largest, not the largest, but the most powerful economically, militarily. And America has the respect of the world. As America goes, so goes the world. There's a reason for it. It's all in the prophetic word. <laughs> what is the only nation that fits this description? What's the only nation? United States of America. Only America. America with her torch raised to the sky. Come. Come to this country. Revelation 13, 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spake like a dragon. And he exerciseth all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And causes all the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the beast. Whose deadly wound was healed. What does the second beast do? The second beast. Through coercion. And through force. Causes. The whole world. It's in the text. To worship the first beast. He performs the Bible says. Great signs. So that he even makes fire come down. From heaven on the earth. In the sight of men. What does the second beast do? He performs miracles. 
He's got power. He's impressing the nations. He's got influence. And the world follows after the second beast who now leads them to worship the first beast. <laughs> American Protestantism will reach across the Gulf, clasp hands with Roman Catholicism in Europe, and they'll form an alliance to worship that first beast. It's the amalgamation of church and state. It's the combination of the church being wrapped up with civil power given to it by the government. Listen, this is a scary message. But it's biblical. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. What does the second beast do? He creates an image to the first beast. What did the first beast do? The first beast hunted down Christians. The first beast locked away the Bible. The first beast through a combination of state and law, decided to coerce obedience from its citizens, persecuted and killed. What does an image mean? The image to the beast is something that looks just like the first beast. He's going to act like the first beast. An image is a likeness of The church and state will unite to enforce religious practices. <laughs> Y'all need to listen to me. And I'm trying to take my time because this is involved so that you don't get, you don't get confused. Does the Bible give any indication of end time events in light of this union of church and state? Look at the events surrounding this union. Her, her sins have reached the heavens. There'll come a time when this world, as violent as it is, will get worse. There'll come a time when with all the economic issues we're having, will get worse than it is. There'll come a time when there'll be tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and the world is in convulsion. There'll come a time when trouble, Daniel says in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, and there was a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. It is at that time that religious leaders will be sought out by civil and governmental leaders asking them, what shall we do? Stay with me. Her sins have reached to heaven. She has lived luxuriously. She has lived palatially. She has lived in ostentation. She has lived with much wealth and affluence. She experiences natural disasters. God's judgments fall, Revelation 18, 10. 10, her riches come to nothing. A spiritual decline will take place in this country and around the world. Natural disasters, social chaos, economic difficulties would lead up to this church and state union. They'll need each other. Satan takes advantage of this situation by introducing a false Spiritual revival. All of a sudden, the entire nation will become spiritual. All of a sudden, religious, non-religious men in government will act like religious people. Like they love the church. Revelation 13, 13 says, He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Great revivals, false revivals will take place. They'll be calling you to prayer for the nation against hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and against economic meltdowns and against crime and the social disintegration in society. They'll call upon you. Let's pray. Let's become one. I know you all are Adventists, but we love Jesus too. 
Let's all become one. I know you all are Protestants and we are Catholics, but let's join hands together. We serve the same God. <laughs> Listen to what the text says. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. <laughs> this is what the book says. Matthew 7 and verse 21, this is what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In the last days, every Christian believer should believe what is revealed in the word more than what you hear people say. Some things will sound good. We are Christians. We love the Lord like you. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for the world. Some things sound good, but every believer must know the word of God for himself. The Lord is telling us before it happens. And the very elect could be lost. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And done many great wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Humanity is on the brink of a great, great tsunami, a spiritual tsunami. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If the devil wanted to unite people religiously, what vehicle do you think he may want to use? That vehicle did he use in early Christianity? That same vehicle. What did he use? <laughs> Church and state. From the two Babylons, page 105, Dr. Hislop says, to conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals amalgamated and to get paganism and Christianity now far sunk in idolatry in this, as in so many other things, to shake hands. When Constantine was about to leave Rome, he turned over the government, not to the governmental leaders, but to the church of Rome. Rome. When Constantine became a Christian, he wanted to infiltrate the church. And so he did it through bringing in festivals into the church that were non-Christian but pagan. And so the amalgamation of church and state and the festivals of pagan Rome came into the Christian church. And you could hardly distinguish one from the other. The church of Rome. Listen to what? William Reinquist, Chief Justice of the United States, the Supreme Court, says, The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. Hmm. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, October 29, 1991, says, As the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, the Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. Broadly, the court's new approach helps conventional regions, religions while hurting un conventional ones. <laughs> Do you know what that means? It means folk who've been in existence for millennia, they got an inside track on not being persecuted. Those who are new on the block, they're in trouble. It seems to be plain that by these laws, the states compel one under the sanction of law to refrain from work or recreation on Sunday because of the majority's views on that day. My brothers and sisters, when the religious people get together, they will by law, a country is known by its laws, they will legislate in this same country that today we experience religious freedom, that everybody must worship on one day so that we could be united and reach our God, not fractured, not disunited, and they will pass laws saying that everybody must stop work on Sunday, must worship God on Sunday. And everybody else who does otherwise will be arrested and put to death and persecuted. That's the amalgamation of state and church, religious and civil. 
And this nation that is a lamb-like beast that affords and allows religious freedom will one day speak as a dragon and make an image to the first beast. <laughs> the state by law makes Sunday a symbol of respect or adherence. State and church. This is what they'll say. All businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislated fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. Hmm. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The day is coming when state and church will get together. And if you don't do what they say through coercion, through persecution, and through death, it will be enforced upon this world. America, the beautiful, will one day speak as a dragon. The New World Order, Pat Robinson, page 236 says, the next obligation that the citizen of God's world order owes to himself, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated a day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state. That's an outright insult to God and his plan. Only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. God's word should be my lamp unto my feet. God's word shall be my light unto my path. God's word, revelation, not convenience, should guide my conscience in these last closing dates of earth's history. And so Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God gave us the Ten Commandments. All of His commandments are binding on us. And in the last book of the Bible, God reminds us that He's expecting us to be faithful to Him. He says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Jesus says to us, He's reminding us, that that first beast says that he has the power and the authority to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And God is saying, no, no, no. I'm calling each of you to be obedient to me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall, even when it's inconvenient, even when they're persecuting you, even after they've legislated and said that you must keep it under the threat of death, an economic boycott. Remain faithful to me. Softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. The Lord is calling for people in these last days of earth's history. To know where you stand. The Hebrews were faithful to God. Those Hebrew worthies stood up for God. When the state says they should not. They did not bow down. And those of us who love the Lord should not bow down. This is a serious message. I took my time today so that somebody could understand it. I was deliberate and careful not to rush through this. I pray that all of us who love the Lord would be faithful to him until that day when he comes to see us in peace. Would you bow your heads with me, loving God? You've set before us a standard of right from wrong. You have taught us that in life we make choices for truth or error, for man or God, for tradition or for revelation. Today, God, we choose you and your truth. Would you help us, Father, to remain faithful to you? 
Give us strength and power and purpose to be obedient to the commandments. To trust your word above convenience. And help us to have strength of power and power in our lives. To be obedient in times when things are rough. And the burdens are many. And society seems to be against us. Help us to hold fast to that word which you have given to us. May we, O oh God, through our service to you this day, be, be, be prepared to follow the dictates of our conscience and the revelation of your holy word. And be faithful to you until that day when we shall see you in peace. May that day come soon, dear God, when we shall see you coming in power and majesty and glory. Save us in thy kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you again, my brothers and sisters of the First Church in Washington, D.C. I'm happy that I was here with you tonight. I want to remind you that tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. we'll meet again for another study. I'll bring to you tomorrow evening the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's an interesting study and one that's relevant to the times in which we live. Pastor Smith, again, thank you, and Pastor Waters for having me, and I look forward to studying with you again on tomorrow evening. God bless you, and be faithful. Good evening again to all our viewers. We want you to know that we are praying for you as you hear these messages from night to night. We hope that in times like these, you are being encouraged in knowing that God loves you and that God is watching over you. If you would like us to pray with you or for you, or if you have Bible questions and concerns, please give us a call, 202-556-1248. That's 202-556-1248. We're waiting to take your call. Until tomorrow night, I wish you God's peace in your heart and in your home. God bless you.